Well, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Katie Patrizio. I'm the Director of Faith Formation here at St. Cecilia's. And just wanted to make a couple of brief announcements before I hand it over to Audrey Nelson, who's going to give our opening talk for us this evening. Um, in the back at the table, you'll find a couple of items. Um, one of them is the schedule for this evening. So it's on this small sheet of paper. After Audrey gives her brief talk, Father is going to expose the Blessed Sacrament, and we're going to have some time for meditation, guided meditation. Father is also going to be hearing confession during that time. Um, after that, we'll have some time for a personal prayer, uh, and we'll end with a guided examination of conscience. And on the back, you'll also find some resources that might be helpful for you. Um, this is a booklet called Miracle Hour. It's uh, a method of prayer that will change your life. Really great book. There are free copies in the back. And you'll also find some uh, small journals, meditation journal pages, pens. For those uh, watching online, if you're interested in the meditation journal page, you can find it on the website for the Evenings of Recollection. So you can go to the St. Cecilia homepage, go to the Faith Formation menu, click on Evenings of Recollection, and then on the right-hand side, there's a link to the meditation journal page. Why don't we begin very briefly with a prayer, and I'll turn to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we praise you and thank you and ask your blessing upon this evening. We pray, Lord, that you would open the ear of our heart that we would be willing to hear your voice. Lord, whether what you give us is for comfort or to, to cause us to do something that may be difficult, we ask for the grace for those things. We pray a special blessing on Audrey as she speaks this evening, that you would give her ease of memory, Lord, and eloquence and speech. And we'll place all these petitions before our Blessed Mother as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, hi, you guys. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay, so my name is Audrey Nelson. Um, I'm a recent graduate from Iowa State University. Uh, I graduated with a degree in public relations and accounting, and now I work in Nevada. I work for a physical therapy company called 21st Century Rehab, so if you have any joint or muscle pain, that's kind of our thing. Um, but anyway, uh, something that I have a pretty bad habit of is I don't pack my lunch ahead of time. And so on my lunch hour, a lot of times I go to Subway to eat my lunch. And on my way to Subway, I pass by this building that's got a little COVID reminder up on it. It says, please keep at a safe distance. And if you can see it, the photo that they chose to go along with this little memo is um, Michelangelo's painting that's on the Sistine Chapel, and it's of uh, God's creation of Adam. 
So Adam is reaching out and God's touching him. And I thought that's a really peculiar image to pick for keep at a safe distance. But yet it kind of reminded me of myself because that's how a lot of times I feel, right? Especially when I'm going through a particularly trying time, it's really easy to feel like God is at a safe distance while I'm here stuck in the mud. And I remember on a particular day, um, I was walking on Central Campus by the Campanile, and I remember feeling like I wanted to take a small rock and just throw it at God. And I had this image of him looking away from me and him, you know, getting hit in the leg with a rock and looking down. And I thought, good. You know, then he can see <laughs> what he's left me to suffer with. And maybe he'll notice his daughter. Because a lot of times when things go wrong, it's really easy to mentally know, hey, God is good. But it's hard to believe that God actually cares about my good. Maybe he's more worried about the good, the big chess game of earth rather than the actual circumstances of my life. Um, and interestingly, I listened to a talk by Father John Ricardo, and he was talking about the fall of Adam and Eve. And he was saying it's not just Adam and Eve's story, it's game film for what Satan always does. So he walks up to Eve and he says, did God really tell you not to eat from the fruit of the tree? If God loved you, he'd let you have that. He won't. He's not good. God is not your father. He's your adversary. You can't trust him. He's holding out on you. And I just broke into tears because that's exactly what I was having a hard time with in my life was I felt that God was holding out on me. And so tonight that's kind of what we get to talk about is, is God really good? Does he care about our good? Or is he just up on a heavenly throne at a safe distance? So uh, with that in mind, I want to talk about the Eucharist, hence the title of the talk. Um, my talk kind of goes in two parts, so at first I'm going to hit your head a little bit, and then I'm going to go for your heart, uh, so kind of hang with me here. Um, but just by a show of hands, and I want you to be honest, who in here has ever struggled with the Catholic Church's teaching on the Eucharist? Because I have. Yeah. Okay. So I remember one time I was driving home with my dad in the truck, and he was pulling the truck into the garage, and I remember saying to him, how can it be Jesus? It's bread. Because I had believed my whole life in the Eucharist, but I'd never really voiced in my head or out loud my doubts about it. And how, how could that be logical? And so I just wondered, like, how, how is that a logical thing? And so just to start with, we should know, what does the Catholic Church actually say? It says, in the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood, together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained. She's like, wow, try to swallow that. We're not just saying a mere symbol of God's presence or like a reminder of God's presence or like eat this bread and like think of me while you eat it, but like it's actually me. And so then my follow-up question is like, okay, well, how can we logically believe that? How can I look an atheist or a Protestant in the eyes and say, I'm not crazy. We have a reason for believing what we believe. And so there's tons that could be said about this, but I think one of the like, easiest is to just go to John 6. And so the context for John 6 is um, Jesus has just fed the 5,000, so he's fed 5,000 people. And so all these crowds come to him again, not because they want to listen to Jesus, but as Father Mike put it, uh, they think Jesus is McDonald's on sandals. And so they say, we want our bread. And instead of just giving them regular bread, Jesus gives, him, gives the most extensive teaching on the Eucharist that he does anywhere else in Scripture. And so I want to just pull out a couple passages for you. And so the first one, he says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and yet they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now I know that um, many people read that and they're like, oh, Jesus must mean this symbolically. He can't possibly mean that literally. Uh, but if that were the case, and if Jesus is just speaking merely symbolically, uh, he's doing a pretty awful job for the best teacher that ever lived. Um, because it goes on to say that the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So clearly the crowds are not taking this symbolically. They're confused. 
And Jesus, instead of clarifying for all of us that he meant it symbolically, goes on and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within yourselves. And this is really interesting because drinking blood was actually against Jewish law. So it's actually forbidden in Leviticus. And so even if Jesus had meant this symbolically and said, drink my blood, it would have been offensive. It would have been like me flipping somebody the bird. Why would he use offensive symbolic language to communicate his point? And so the question is, okay, well, why is blood forbidden? So Leviticus says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. And so the very reason that blood is forbidden in the Old Testament is the very reason it's commanded in the New. Because God doesn't want us just taking on some animal's life. He wants us taking on his own divine life. And so we're commanded to drink Jesus' blood because it's his life that he wants to give us, not the life of some animal. And then Jesus goes on and his words intensify. So at first, the Greek translation of the word that Jesus is using is phago, which means to eat. Right? And so if there's any misunderstanding about this, Jesus makes it that much more obvious, and he starts to use the Greek word trogo, and it means to chew or to munch or to gnaw on. And that certainly wouldn't be my word choice if I were trying to communicate to some crowds of Jewish people that I was trying to speak symbolically. But instead he goes on and he says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food. And my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. And then the disciples, right? So we can always kind of have a measure of what was Jesus really trying to say based on how these people are reacting? It says, therefore, many of his disciples, not just the crowds, when they heard it, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can accept it? And they sound a lot like I did in the garage, right? Like, how can it be Jesus? How can it be true? This is a difficult statement. But then Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this. He said to them, does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. But there are some of you who do not believe. Now, a lot of people get really snagged up on this because he says it's the Spirit that gives life. And so sometimes people think, um, okay, uh, spiritual means symbolic. Therefore, Jesus, this whole thing, it's all been symbolic. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, Jesus has just said six times in only seven verses, that it's necessary to eat his flesh. So why would he contradict everything he just made a point to say? Second of all is that spiritual doesn't mean symbolic. So John 4, 24 says that God is spirit. And none of us sitting in this room think that God is merely a symbol. And uh, also he says that the flesh is no avail. He doesn't say my flesh is no avail. So elsewhere in the, in the Bible, if you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak when he's talking to the disciples because they're all falling asleep. So he's talking about human weakness. And I think you can really see human weakness when you try and teach people about the Eucharist because it's difficult, right? And so it is the spirit that gives life while our flesh, our human weakness, is of no avail. All right, and then if there were any doubts left, it says as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So if Jesus is trying to clarify and say, guys, calm down. I only meant it symbolically. Don't freak out. I was saying merely that you need to accept my message. That's what I was saying. And I have had somebody tell me that that's what it means before. Well, he's doing a pretty awful job at teaching them because his disciples are leaving him. And you can imagine that there's all these vast crowds. And so you can just imagine this mass exodus away from Jesus. Not only the crowds, but also his own followers that are now going back to their own way of life. And what does Jesus do? Say, come, come back, quick. I, I, I didn't really mean that. He doesn't. He turns to his 12 disciples and he says, do you also want to leave? Because as I've heard it put, if we don't want the Eucharist, we don't want Jesus. Because
because that's exactly what the Eucharist is, is it is Jesus. And so that, echo, that echoes throughout the ages of, do you also want to leave? Because if you don't want the Eucharist, you don't want me. And Jews understood symbolism, right? We never hear any Jew having a problem with Jesus saying, I'm the vine, or I'm the gate, or I'm the good shepherd, even though he was a carpenter, or that I'm the light. None of them seem to have a problem with Jesus saying any of those things. But the problem here is not that Jesus is being misunderstood. The problem is that he's being understood rightly, and they're rejecting his teaching. And so Simon Peter, as our first pope, answers Jesus, and he says, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. And so my guess is that Peter probably didn't know all of what Jesus had just said. He wouldn't have known what it meant. But he knew that this person in front of him was God. And if God declared it, so it was. And so we have to follow the example of our first pope, our father, and say, Jesus, it's difficult. But I know who you are, and I believe you. And again, this has been, this is what the church has always taught. It was not something that was developed later. It's not something that some saint came and said, like, hey, I think this is how we should understand it. It's always been the way it's been taught. So St. Paul writes, Not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give, thanks a participation in the blood of Christ. It is not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ. And I really enjoy this. Cyril of Jerusalem in the 4th century wrote, Therefore, do not consider them as bare bread and wine, for according to the declaration of the Master, they are the body and blood. Even if the senses suggest this to you, let faith reassure you. Do not judge the reality by taste, but having full assurance from faith, realize that you have been judged worthy of the body and blood of Christ. All right, now, if you're like me, I'm like, well, still, what if there was just some horrible, horrible misunderstanding? And that's not what Jesus meant to convey, and this has just been all some horrible uh, arrangement of circumstances. Well, if you ever have some time, look up Eucharistic miracles, because in this instance in Buenos Aires in 1996, sometimes Jesus reveals it to us in a way our senses can perceive a little more readily. And so a piece of the Eucharist um, started changing visibly into a, a piece of flesh. And so they sent it to a lab, and what they found out was that it was actually a piece of the heart ventricle, and the cells inside of it were still beating from a Middle Eastern man who'd been tormented about the chest, is what this uh, cardiologist found out without knowing that it was the Eucharist. And so he was just like, how did you bring to me a piece of live heart into my lab? And then, of course, they had to tell him where it came from. Um, but anyway, so if that's true, if that's all true, if the Catholic Church has gotten this right, then what does that actually have to do with my life? And what does that have to do with the whole list of questions I shoveled out at the beginning of this? So this is like one of my favorite things ever. Um, this is one of my favorite Bible verses. And Jesus says it in the Last Supper Discourses of John. So it's right before he's about to be crucified. And he says, as the Father loves me, so I also love you. And that just, to me, seemed really wild. Like, we're talking about God the Father. I love you as much as God the Father loves me. How much do you think God the Father loves his perfect, sinless, only begotten, eternal son? I would imagine that God the Father loves his son perfectly, completely, with his whole entire self. And Jesus goes on, and he says, and he's talking specifically about us, not just the apostles. He's specifically talking about all of us. He says, I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one, as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be brought to perfection as one. That the world may know that you sent me, and that you love them, even as you loved me. Father, they are your gift to me. I wish that where I am, they also may be with me. So time out. We're saying that, that God the Father loves us as much as he loves Jesus? Because when I read that, like, I've read that verse so many times, but I remember reading that and being like, am I understanding that correctly? 
Is that like some blasphemous thing? To think that God could love me as much as he loves God? As much as he loves his entire self? And just think, God's infinite, right? So God made all the stars, right? There's a line in Genesis that says, God made the sun, and he made the moon. And it's like, and he made the stars also, like kind of a side note, like, oh, yeah, he made those. Well, how many stars? So Father John likes to talk about this, and he says that if you built a sandcastle, and each little grain of sand was a star, how big would your castle be? So it would be five miles long and five miles wide and five miles tall. And just to give you an idea, the tallest skyscraper in the world is a little over half a mile. Five miles tall, and each little grain of sand is a star. God made that simply by willing it. And you're like, okay, well, how, how big is a star? So our star, the sun, it's not that remarkably large. You could fit about 1.3 million Earths into our star. So that's one star. If you're talking about a bigger star, so one of the biggest stars is called Canis Majoris. That translates to, like, the big dog, which is a really cool name for a star. You could fit seven quadrillion Earths into that one star. You know, seven quadrillion, I don't know what that means. How big is seven quadrillion Earths? All right, if I asked you to count from now to a million, how long do you think it would take you? I'll see you in 12 days if you want to count from now to a million. If you want to count from now to a billion, I'll see you in 31 years. If you want to count from now to a trillion, I'll see you in 31,000 years. If you start counting from now to a quadrillion, I'll see you in 31 million years. And that's one star. That's how many of our planet could fit in one star. And in our sandcastle, that's one grain of sand. This is a massive universe. And God made it all without any effort. And with all of his effort, he loves you. Not the perfect you. Not the you that you will be someday. Not the you that will be in heaven, but the you right now. God loves you perfect. With his whole self. With no holdouts. Sometimes I... uh, I feel like God loves me, of course, but sometimes I compare myself to another saint, and I think God must love that one more because they're more perfect. And so I worry that I'm kind of like a little thimble, and I've got this big hole in my center that's made to be filled with water, with, with God's love, and I imagine him as this pitcher, right? And he's pouring and pouring to all these people, and by the time he gets to the end, will he have enough water? to fill me, or will I just be that much short? And there's me naively wondering, does God have enough love for me, or would he possibly be that generous? And in reality, God's love is a lot more like Niagara Falls, because thousands and thousands of gallons fall off Niagara Falls, and I'm still just a little thimble, naively wondering at the bottom if there's going to be enough. And God says, yeah, there's more than you're ever going to use. And that doesn't have any end, because thousands and thousands just keep pouring over the edge. But, okay, so I wrote this talk a long time ago, and I've given it before. And so it's supposed to end right about now, and maybe that's what you're wishing, is that it would just end right about now. (laughs) Uh, But the problem was I was having doubts, because I thought to say that Jesus loves me as much as God loves the Father, I thought that can only be due to God alone. Is it blasphemous to say that God loves me that much? And I was afraid that I would get up here and I would tell people, God loves you infinitely. And I would find out later, oh, just slightly shy of that. I'm like, what if I tell people wrong? What if I say something that's like offensive to God? And so um, I was working on this talk and then the next day was Sunday. And so I, I got down, I was in my living room and I knelt down by the couch and I said, God, you're good. You don't need me to make anything up about you to make you better than you are. If I'm wrong about this, show me. But if I'm right, give me confidence. And I finished praying, and I just kind of thought, like, maybe I'll get, like, a feeling. Or, like, I just kind of like, well, you know, I tried. Most of the time when I pray, I don't always expect, like, immediate, tangible results, if you know what I'm saying. But I go to Mass, and I'm a Eucharistic minister, which is common. And I'm standing up on the altar, and I'm waiting to receive the body of Christ to go distribute it to the people. And I'm paying attention to the choir singing. 
And the choir starts singing No Greater Love, and guess what? It just so happens that that song has, uh, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, John 15, 9. And I thought, is that a sign? Like, that's amazing, because that wasn't in the verses, and this was during Lent, and so I expected, you know, maybe more somber kind of songs, and I thought, that's pretty weird. And then the second song started, and guess what Bible verse it had in it? John 15, 9, and I was like, wow. And then the third song started, and I was like, nah, like that's not going to happen. And then again, it was John 15, 9, and like one of the last verses. And I called my dad after Mass, and I was like, I think God just spoke to me. But then don't anybody stone me, because I'm a difficult human being, and God already knows it. But I still doubted because, like, time would go by where I would feel kind of confident, but I was still like, what if, what if that was just a coincidence? And I really just, like, messed up. And so time would go on, and I would have, like, recurring doubts about this. And so one time I was in adoration, and I was kind of struggling. And you guys, if I can give you, like, one takeaway from this talk, one of the biggest ones would be, like, A, that God loves you, but B, that you need to read this book. <laughs> Because this book is about Jesus' revelations to a priest. And it has, it has a, it's geared towards priests quite a bit. But I love this book because I know that God loves everybody perfectly. And watching Jesus love this priest and the way he talks to him, it lets me see Jesus' personality and how much he loves us. And so everybody should read this book. But anyway, what Jesus said to me and to this priest on this particular night where I'm struggling to know if God is talking to me. He says, See all that I have done for you, to bring you closer to myself, to make you live in my presence and in the light of my Eucharistic face. See the changes I have wrought in you, and know from these things the truth of our conversations. For my desire is and remains to speak to your heart, even as a man speaks to his friend. When doubts come, dismiss them. Know that I speak to you in a language drawn from your experience and from the resources of your own imagination and mind. The message nonetheless is mine. It is I who am communicating with you in this way to hold you fast in my divine friendship and to draw you into the sanctuary of my heart. There to worship and glorify with me the Father who is the source of all heaven's gifts. There too in my heart are you filled with the Holy Spirit and lifted into a union with my priestly prayer that no human effort can merit or produce. All of this, you see, is my gift to you, a gift offered to you out of my gracious and merciful love. Do not yield to fear, to doubt, and to a purely human scrutiny of something which is of me, which I freely communicate to you out of love. Above all else, be grateful and allow my peace to descend into your heart and fill you with a holy joy. And I wrote that down in the bottom of my journal, and guess what Bible verse was down there? John 15, 9. <laughs> and I went home, and I was just so full of joy. And some, one of the things I do is I like to write down my favorite things on some colored piece of paper that I got at Hobby Lobby. And so that night I went home, and I, and I drew this picture. And uh, I wrote that down to remind myself. And it was kind of a reflection of I used to... I used to, when I lay down at night, to kind of relax. I don't know what you think about. Um, but I started having this desire to reach out and just touch God's most inmost being. Because I kind of imagine getting to heaven, and you're so thrilled. You're so thrilled to see this God who saved you, who died on a cross for you. And you just want to squeeze him so hard, but, like, that's painful. And I was like, what do you do to express love for God? Because, like, a, a wife and a husband, they express love sexually. But what do you do for a love that's greater than sexual love? How do you express that with your whole self? And so I just had this, this image of like taking my hand and just touching like the inmost light of God. And I didn't really do much with those thoughts. I was like, um, I, I think I'll, I'll figure it out when I get to heaven, I guess, you know. I just sort of kept that as a nice thought. But then there was one day where I was holding the blood of the chalice. And as I was standing there, I realized that here I was holding God's infinite heart, <laughs> and he was loving me with all of it. And so when I, I started drawing these images, and actually I had a friend say to me one time, he was explaining the sacred heart, because it had never really appealed to me much as a kid, 
my aunt and uncle had these pictures of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Sacred Heart of Mary in their house, and they were really pale and really faded. And you can tell how vain I am because I looked at Mary and I saw her with her heart and I kind of thought she was saying to me, my heart's better than yours. And so I, I never really was attracted to the image at all. But then my friend was explaining it to me and he says, Jesus' passion is really close to his heart. And that's all he said and he made this really poor drawing on a piece of paper. And for whatever reason, the grace of God revealed it to me by saying, my passion is close to my heart. He's saying, you are close to my heart because we are what the passion is for. And so I started drawing this as an expression of God's perfect love. And again, <laughs> God kept talking. Um, it was on the Feast of the Sacred Heart because this image had become really close to me. And on that day, I happened to be able to go to daily mass. It was a Friday. And so I was really like pleased that I got to go to mass on the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Um, but then that night, I went home and I, and I read a book. And it was about revelations to uh, two saints, and Jesus said to them, uh, actually to just one of them, he said, another day she saw our Lord opening the wound of his loving heart and saying to her, see the immensity of my love, measure it by those words I address to my brethren, as my father hath loved me, I also have loved you. Have you ever heard words which express a stronger or more tender love? And for me, it was just like another gift of confirmation that God loved me with his whole self. That I didn't have anything to worry about, that I hadn't misunderstood, that it hadn't just been wishful thinking on my part. And so if any of you have doubts, because I know that Satan wants us to believe something like, God loves everyone else that way. God loves everyone else with a perfect and complete love. Just not you. And I just need you to know that Satan is lying to you. Because he lies to me all the time. And I, and I constantly feel like I have to earn his love. I have to measure up. I have to, I have to be more holy. I have to grow in this virtue. I have to do that thing. And God's like, I love you perfect, even if you never do any of those things. I love you perfect now. And that's the whole point of the Eucharist is because God didn't just want us, he didn't want to wait for us to just die and go to heaven. It's not just about, like, trying to be as good as you can until you get there. God is like, I can't wait that long. I want you to have my whole heart now. I want to be with you physically now. I want you to be able to touch me now. I want you to talk to me now. I love you so much right now. And so that's the whole point of the Eucharist is because every time you and I go to Mass, we receive the perfect, infinite God who loves us with his perfect, infinite self. And he places his whole heart right on our hands. And he says, here's my whole heart. Give me your heart in return. And he has no holdouts. And he's perfect, and he loves you with his whole self. So there's no more love that you have to gain. You don't have to kill yourself trying to earn it. You already have heaven's greatest treasure, which is God himself. And so as I kind of transition out, uh, I know I could go on. God, that wasn't all of it. God did even more for me than I have time to talk about. But what are some, like, practical ways we can grow in love for the Eucharist? I think the first is the most obvious, which is just go to Mass. Anytime you're in the presence of the Eucharist, I, I heard a line one time that I've never forgotten, which is, the Eucharist is like the sun. No matter what you do, you get vitamin D. And so even if you spaced out the whole time, or if you're, there's a child next to you that's screaming, or you, you completely miss the homily, but you don't tell Father Don that, um, Jesus is still there, and you still receive him, and so that's the best way. Uh, second, what we're about to do tonight is adoration. I think scheduling a regular time for adoration is just an incredible gift. And I'd also say one of the small ways we can do is, just, like, treating the Eucharist like it is what we say it is. So, like, I remember growing up, so I've been in the Ames area my whole life. I would genuflect, but I would just kind of genuflect in the general direction of the altar, just, like, forward. But now when I genuflect, I actually start looking for the tabernacle. Because that's what you do when you're in front of a king. You kneel down. So, like, find him with your eyes. So when you walk into a new church, instead of just genuinely, like, genuflecting in the general direction of the altar, see if you can find the tabernacle. Because at St. Thomas, it's in, it's in the daily mass chapel. It's in a different direction. So actually turn your body and be like, I'm looking for him. And even, like, the way we do the mass. Because I know it's easy to space out. But when the priest holds up and he says, behold the Lamb of God, I want you to remember 
Behold God's love for you. And let that be a trigger of, that's, that's him, and he loves me. Or when you walk up to communion, um, there's a lot that we can do in our, in our thoughts. So pick an image that stands out to you. So maybe it's imagining yourself as a bride in a royal court, walking up to marry or groom the king. Maybe it's you're a soldier and you're walking up to the king to get knighted. Maybe you're the magi walking up on Christmas to give gifts to the baby Jesus. I remember one time I was walking up to communion and I thought, people waited thousands of years for the man that I'm walking up to right now. Like, I have that privilege. So when you walk up, if you realize that you've spaced out during the entire consecration, which sometimes I do, you have that moment of like, Jesus, like, I'm excited to see you. I'm excited to hold you. And it's not just when you're in Mass, but Jesus actually stays with us. So when we walk out of Mass, we're the tabernacle. So he's actually with you, which was the whole point, right? He talked about in that verse in John 17, 23, that he wanted us to be one with him and one with the Father. And so when we have Jesus, we're united to God. That's the whole point. It's good news. All right, and finally, I have to tell you this. This is such a good book, you guys. Like, there's so much that Brant Petre talks about in knowing why we believe about the Eucharist, what we does, that I can't even, like, touch the surface of. So good. Like, I read this book, and I was like, why hasn't anyone told me before? And I lit- it didn't make me want to dance. It actually made me dance because I was so excited. I get really giddy. Um, it, is, it is, like, very theological, um, but it's, it's exciting stuff. And so if you want to know, like, where is the Catholic Church getting this? Or if you have friends that are like, I, you know, I don't understand this book. Super duper good. Um, but lastly, I just want to leave you with that God loves you so much. You are not the exception. He loves you totally, perfectly. Don't let anybody tell you any different. O saving victim, open wide the gate of heaven to us below. Our foes press on from every side. Your aid supply, your grace bestow. To your 
great name be endless praise. Immortal Godhead, one in three, O oh, grant us endless length of days in our true native land with thee. Amen. Canto ego sacramentum, venere merce nui, et antiquum documentum, no voce dat ritui, Praised at fide supplementum, sensum defectui, genitori genitoque, laus et jubilatio. Salus ona virtus quoque, sit et benedictio, procedenti abutroque, compassit laudatio. Amen.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. We turn the attention of our minds and of our hearts to Jesus Christ present before us. And as always, we do that in order to pray. And we pray with our heart by telling him that we believe in him, that we hope in him, and that we want to give ourselves to him in love. And to help that prayer happen, I'd like to make a few considerations that perhaps are not the most usual ones that we make when considering the Eucharist. And those two considerations are the final judgment, the end of time, and Jesus' second coming. The final judgment, the fact that at the end of history, when everything is completed, God will come and judge everyone who has ever lived, is one of the more repeated messages of Jesus in his ministry. Time and again, he tells parables. He gives examples. One of the parables that Jesus tells about the final judgment, you remember it, he, shut, he sends, you know, everyone lines up, it's, uh, and he says to the people on his left that they are condemned, and the people on his right that they are saved. And he tells them why. He tells the people who are saved, we'll leave apart the people who are damned, he tells the people who are saved because when I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. And the interesting point is their reaction. They're surprised. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? Or when did we clothe you? Or when did we visit you? I wasn't aware of doing that. What's interesting is that precisely what saves them is what really wasn't on their minds. They really weren't aware of it. And therefore, in this parable, Jesus shows us that salvation, what matters in that moment where everything is decided for eternity, does not consist primarily in what we think or what we're conscious of, but in our actions, the choices that we make. And I mention this as we turn, and then we'll get into it with the New Testament, as we turn to consider the Eucharist. Because our adoration and our worship of the Eucharist needs to be first and foremost an act of love, even if right now it doesn't seem to me that he's present. I may not feel it particularly. Perhaps what I, is more apparent and what impinges more on my mind and my imagination is the things that I have to do, the upset that I had earlier today at work, that difficulty in family, that other problem I'm having in a relationship, those things are more on the surface. We feel them more intensely. Jesus giving himself with all of his human and divine heart in the Eucharist, which is the fact, which is what is happening. Perhaps right now, as we try to pray, it doesn't seem that that's the case. But very importantly, we need to grasp in faith that it is. That's what faith is, and that's where salvation happens. And, and for us, in our life of prayer, one of the things that is so important and helps us so much centering on the Eucharist is that we can go beyond how I might feel or find myself in a given moment. And I say that's a great consolation because 
you surely have the experience that there are moments where you can't really change the way you feel or the stress that you have or the circumstances that you find yourself in because it just is. But even though it is that way, it is still possible to pray if I understand prayer in this way. It's something that I choose. Lord, I turn to you right now and I worship you, and I adore you, and I I want to feel your presence more. But I believe that as long as I am faithful to that prayer, that action is what is really transforming me, whatever the appearance is. But let's consider more this idea of appearances, and I mentioned this point of Jesus' second coming. Again, another thing that we don't usually think about we think about the Eucharist, Jesus' second coming. This isn't some obscure doctrine that a few evangelical churches in the south of the United States are into, you know, the rapture and waiting for the end times. And I grew up in South Texas, you see. I remember one time there was, it was announced that there was going to be a certain day. I think it was like in, I must have been like nine or ten years old. There was a, in the area where I was, there were people going around saying that like at the end of the month, Jesus was coming, end of the world, all of this was happening. My mother kept assuring us that it wasn't the case. <laughs> but I kind of remember as the day, God was like, kind of like, wonder what's going to happen. Like, you know, <laughs> nothing happened as you, <laughs> you realized <laughs> as it is. But it's not, Jesus' second coming is not something that certain people with a mistaken reading of the Bible harp on. It's actually the heart of our Christian belief. Every Sunday we profess it in the creed. I believe that Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. Now, the point is this, though. When Jesus, we say Jesus is going to come again, almost implicitly we can be led to think that, well, if he's going to come, he's somewhere else. Right? If he's going to come, kind of maybe without thinking it explicitly, kind of our imagination, we kind of, He's going to fly from some heavenly space and come here because he has to come. Well, that's why other passages in the New Testament are helpful in other biblical language. For example, the way in which St. Paul and also St. John and some of his letters say not so much they're talking about the same event, the same reality. They don't say that Jesus is going to come again, but they say when Jesus appears in other words he's not come, he's not absent now and he's going to come in the future he is here but the difference is is at the end of time that presence will be universally manifest and definitive and in fact the, the word that they use when Jesus appears very much suggests the drawing back of a curtain the revealing of something that was always there, but perhaps hidden from view and people were acting as if it wasn't there. That should inspire in us a wonder, a desire to worship, that right now, behind the thin veil of the appearance of bread, the resurrected king of the universe is present because he loves me. Because he wants me to have the fullness of his life and joy. Because he's interested in my life because he's given me a mission and a vocation. He accompanies me, he suffers me, and he is present. Both of these considerations, the consideration of the last judgment that we're saved for what we do, the consideration of the second coming that Jesus is not transporting himself to where he is to where he's not, but he is present, and the second coming will be the revelation of that presence. Both of these things need to help us appreciate the Eucharist on sure footing, a more solid faith. This solid faith that helps us worship, adore. 
And to worship and to adore is to explicitly, on purpose, recognize and indeed celebrate that God is so much greater. Lord, help us understand and appreciate the immensity of who you are, of your love, of your power. Part of what can give us peace and even a sense of salvation is is recognizing that, thank God, I am not at the center of the universe. The things going on in my life are actually not the most important things. To get perspective. To see that I'm actually in God's hands. And those are loving hands. And the reason that I know that are loving hands, one of the reasons, is precisely the Eucharist. This reality of Jesus' presence, this objective importance of our choices, can also help us in our efforts to have this daily personal prayer. To realize that when we're praying, we are encountering someone else. And this, this may be too kind of obvious a point to make, but, but I think it's, it can be a helpful one. But we're encountering someone else. We're not simply talking to ourselves. And all of us know that there's a huge difference between talking to someone and talking to ourselves. Think about the last time you were distressed and you, had to, you were upset about something. If you could choose, all right, you can just go in the room and talk to yourself, or you can get on the phone and talk to your best friend. None of us would say, well, you know, I kind of want to waste the money on the phone call. I'll just talk to myself, and it'll be the same. Right? Obviously, it matters that I'm dealing with someone who is not me. Because that's where love happens. That's where clarity happens. And it's also where prayer needs to happen. Lord, in my prayer right now, I am talking to you. You are listening. You who transcend my imagination, who transcend my ability to understand, my ability to grasp, you are there receiving all that I say, all that I feel, all that I give. And we need to get to that point in our prayer because we're practicing, because we're striving that we realize that, that he's listening. In a sense, we feel it. And sometimes that'll be because you're using words, you're because you're using imagination, but many times it will be because you don't use any of that. It's just enjoying his presence. And the Eucharist, and especially our celebration this past Sunday, the solemnity of, the, of Corpus Christi, the ability to have Eucharistic adoration, to be in his Eucharistic presence, is an important opportunity for us to experience, and again, to use that word, to practice enjoying that presence, with, presence of someone else, but not just anyone else, of him, of God. With the time that's left in our prayer, I'd like to turn to the New Testament and try precisely to use our imagination so that it helps us engage our heart, engage our will, so that we can embrace him and, of course, most importantly, be embraced by him. And to imagine the Last Supper that solemn moment of intimacy where Jesus gathers around his friends and he gives them the gift that we are contemplating now, the gift of his body and blood, his life in the Eucharist. And that scene of the Last Supper that we're very familiar with, to try to imagine it with Jesus in the center of the apostles, each one of them close around him in that dim silence at night. Two or three of the apostles leaning forward, straining to hear the words that are 
gathered in St. John's Gospel, words that express Jesus' friendship, words that express his love, his intention for each one of them and for you and I. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus' zeal, his desire. The Eucharist doesn't move. It is still and it is silence. But that silence needs to speak to you and I of perfect activity, the dynamism of God himself the dynamism that precedes your thinking and mine, that speaks in the very depths of our souls, calling us by name. That silence, that stillness, is not passivity, but it is the pure activity of God's love. And that's what Jesus says, very, in the, very, I have eagerly desired these to pass over with you. Why? So that he could give us this. So that we could have the Eucharist. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. These are words that are familiar to us, but as we try to hear them in prayer, As you hear these words, tell him right now that you believe in him. And as you tell him, as you engage that faith, try to feel yourself being handed over to him. Because that is what faith is in many ways. Jesus, I put myself completely in your hands. And completely means without holding on to a desire for reassurance, without being worried of how things might turn out. Jesus, I want to put myself in your hands. I I dare to believe that you are there to receive me and to hold me. That your hands are strong hands, they are secure hands, They are hands that are capable of holding every aspect and facet of my life. Therefore, I don't need to worry about it so much. I just need to live it. I need to face it and embrace it with the sense of mission that he gives me. Without looking over my shoulder. Without trying to future-proof everything that I do by running it through my mind and my imagination. Lord, I believe in you. I believe that you are present. And Jesus continues speaking to the apostles crowded around him, speaking precisely to this willingness to entrust. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. It's really a beautiful moment in the Last Supper. Because Jesus has been living day in and day out with these men, traveling with them, countless meals, conversations. He's lost his temper with them. He's spoken to them one-on-one. He's laughed with them. He's enjoyed their company. They know him. And with that confidence, with that friendship, Jesus is telling you, believe in God. They, they were, they were God fearing Jews. They had faith. And Jesus sees it. Believe in God. But as they saw his familiar humanity, Jesus the man, as you believe in God, believe also in me. Trust in me. I know I look just like a man. I know I just seem to be Jesus to you. But believe in God, believe also in me. It isn't a very similar what Jesus is saying to us from the Eucharist. Believe also that this is me. That that loving face, that kind voice, those merciful hands that we consider in the Gospels, that this is me right here. You believe in the Gospels, believe also in me. 
believe that I am the same Jesus present here. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. This is a promise, a promise that Jesus makes. Right now in your prayer, tell him that you want to believe in this promise. That's hope, hoping in him, that he is not leaving you orphaned, that he is coming to you. Even if the world does not see him, you can see him with the eyes of faith. But you have to want to. And that wanting needs to express itself in actions. The choice to pray and the choice to try and seek him out in the middle of what you're doing in your work, making that time for him during the day, in that humility to worship, to adore, to acknowledge him for who he is, Every single one of us, to one degree or another, wants to, and here I speak very generally, improve. We want to grow. We want to improve in our work. We want to improve in our relationships. We just want, would like to anyway. Again, I say various degrees. We just like to be better people, maybe a little bit less lazy, maybe finally get off the couch and start exercising. Stop putting off that other thing that I've been putting off, whatever it may be. We all want to grow, and and we want to improve. But at the same time, the same time, and perhaps even more deeply, each of us wants to know that we are loved, even if we're not improving or growing. Even if I am a little bit shabby and kind of lazy and rough around the edges, I want to know, I need to know, and this is what gives us security and confidence, that just as I am, in some way, I am okay, worth loving. And Jesus Christ, present in the Eucharist, present before us, brings these two desires together perfectly. The desire to know that I'm loved Not because I achieve something, not because I do something, but because I am. And the desire to improve, to grow, to change, to convert, to break with sin in a decided way, in a wholehearted way. Those two desires that might seem to be in conflict, and sometimes in our minds we can get kind of complicated, or even when you try to speak about it, as I'm trying to right now, it it gets lost, but... In the Eucharist, in prayer, what seems complicated and opposed needs to become simple and clear. We need to understand it in our souls. To contemplate that Jesus in the Eucharist, when we worship him in exposition, is there revealing us his love. When we receive him in the Mass, we receive him as forgiveness, mercy, And also so that he become our food so that we might be sent. So that we might bring his joy and his truth to others through our friendship and our concern and all of the opportunities that we have being shoulder to shoulder with so many people in so many different situations. He gives us that unconditional love in this very same moment that he gives us that love as mission. Mission to improve ourselves and through our interest and concern to help our friends and our colleagues improve as well. As we consider the Eucharist and as we end our prayer now, we remind ourselves, in the beginning we spoke about maybe a presence that sometimes we may not notice. But Mary is always at Jesus' side. And so often we don't notice her presence as well. 
But again, the same truth applies. Just because we don't notice, just because it doesn't seem that she's at my side, doesn't mean that she's not. And it can be a helpful way of learning how to speak to Jesus in the Eucharist, to ask Mary. Mary, I don't know what to say. I don't know if I'm doing it in the right way. I feel a little bit lost. Like I'm kind of stumbling around and trying to find the switch in the dark in a room and making my way forward and banging my shins on coffee tables. and Don't know. Ask for her help. Ask for her guidance. And keep reaching. Keep striving with determination. An unshakable determination that brings us with that sincere desire to find him in our personal prayer, the times we have, but to really make that effort, if we can, as we are right now, and many of you have this evening, to encounter him in the Eucharist. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, and a seat for me.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. An examination of conscience. Am I aware of the danger of lukewarmness? What specific means do I intend to use to give my life a clear course towards God? Do I try to imitate Jesus in his persevering and silent work during the years of his hidden life in Nazareth? Do I seek the Lord in ordinary things, what others consider unimportant that occupy me during my day? Or do I deceive myself, believing I will serve God in great things which seldom come along? In my examinations of conscience, am I especially attentive to sins and imperfections of omission, especially as regards living charity and fortitude with my family and carrying on a daring and constant apostolate among my friends? Am I conscious of the need for personal mortification and penance to embrace the cross in a generous imitation of Christ? Do I look for small, hidden opportunities to, de to deny myself, especially in my professional work, my family obligations, and in forcing myself to understand others?
Am I demanding and ambitious in my professional work, doing everything necessary to work competently and efficiently so as to have more time for God and others? Am I hard on myself in refusing to work overtime unless absolutely necessary? Do I see more clearly than ever the central role that Mary, my mother, should play in my life? Will I turn to her more frequently by praying the rosary, the angelus, and the memorari? Do I ask for light to see the need for regular confession, seeing the sacrament as a golden opportunity to experience God's mercy and forgiveness? Do I prepare my confession so that it is contrite, concrete, complete, clear, and concise? Am I convinced of my duty to win others for Christ? Do I see this apostolate as the natural outgrowth of deep and sincere friendships with others? Am I aware of my almost infinite capacity to excuse myself by indulging in rationalizations? Do I try to put a stop to this by examining my conscience every evening for a brief time, even just three minutes?
and we end our examination with a silent act of contrition. Down in adoration falling, this great sacrament we hail. Over ancient forms of worship, newer rites of grace prevail. Faith will tell us Christ is present when our human senses fail. To the everlasting Father and the Son who made us free, and the Spirit God proceeding from them each eternally be salvation, honor, blessing, might and endless majesty. Amen. You have given them bread from heaven, having within it all sweetness. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you give us the Eucharist as the memorial of your suffering and death. May our worship of this sacrament of your body and blood Help us to experience the salvation you won for us and the peace of the kingdom where you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.
Please repeat the divine praises. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Blessed be the great mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. Holy God, we praise thy name. Lord of all, we bow before thee. All on earth thy scepter claim. All in heaven above adore 